Good morning. Welcome to the last program in our 2022 Meet Us in the Garden series. We've got a big slate up for next year, so we're not, not going to forget doing those. I'm Susan Cowling, and I've been a Master Gardener for 2008. I retired as a statistician and trainer at the Lubrizol Corporation and said, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I said, I'm going to become a Master Gardener, and I did. And I got to do two things that I just simply love, gardening and teaching. What could be better? Come on. So we're going to talk a little bit about our critters, the ones that we've sort of displaced in terms of habitats. Uh, I was driving here, came over the, the bridge on 615, there's this poor little raccoon. He's just sitting there watching everybody go by. And I'm thinking, you ain't going to make it till tomorrow, buddy, because he's going to take off. And the only reason he's there on a bridge, there's no land around on the bridge. Why is he there? We took away his habitat. So maybe it's time to give back a little bit, maybe not for all of those critters, and you may want to pick some that you don't want to attract and others that you do. And anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's going to be kind of heavy on pollinator habitats because that's really critical, uh, but we do, we'll be talking about some others. So we're going to talk a little bit about planning and what kind of habitats or aspects of habitats. Water is absolutely critical and it's something we forget about in the winter time especially, so it's, it is critical. We also want to talk about protection, why we want to build these habitats, because we do want to protect some of these critters. Uh, there's some references and some information about the Master Gardener program towards the end. So, but I'm making a huge assumption standing up here and looking out at you. You enjoy nature and you value wildlife. You may not like what they do to your gardens, but you value it, okay? So the practices that we're gonna talk about hopefully will increase the wildlife, but may, maybe it won't, not the first year or so. They have to find you before it's gonna work. And you need to do a little homework yourself. I can't give you all of the information about all of the animals you might want to be encouraging to join you, whether it's a particular type of songbird or a particular type of moth or butterfly or bee for that matter. Uh, so you, you can do some homework on your own and, and discover what they need specifically. I'll also talk a little bit about how to protect your plants because if you invite these critters in they're going to be looking for food they're going to be looking for shelter they're going to be looking for a bunch of stuff and it may interfere <laughs> with what, what your comfort level is <clears throat> so what are we what are the basic needs of any organism and that includes us we need food we need cover a shelter of some sort. Uh, we need water and we need space. I mean, we're not going to want to be, right? Okay. So the good habitat is going to attract all of those critters, songbirds, butterflies, bees, even reptiles and amphibians. And you may not want that green snake in your backyard, but he needs a house too. So. I'll tell you a little story about that down the road. But it's also going to allow you to have fun. If you've got a window that overlooks your backyard, what better on a snowy day to look out and see that you have provided for these critters and they're out and about and they're having a good time. Okay, here are some critters we're going to talk about. I mean, we've got our mammals over there, we've got our amphibians here, we've got our birds, we've got our butterflies and bees and larvae, 
and you've got a mole and you've got a, a mole and a vole and some deer, so, and your squirrels, of course, and your chippy over on the left. Yeah. That's one of the critters I really wish I could do without, but it's just me. Okay. So planning ahead is, is really critical. You can't just assume that if you put out a pot of water, you've done all you need to do. So you are going to plan ahead. And as I said before, you want to determine which species you want to pull into your yard. If all you want to do are pollinators, that's fine. I mean, they need help. And, and interestingly enough, once you provide the habitats for the pollinators, the bees and the butterflies and the moths, you're going to get birds because they need to eat up some of those caterpillars and the eggs. And so it's, you know, you're, you're providing for a variety of species when you just think about providing for one. And you're going to learn what will attract them. What kind of flowers do you plant uh, that will attract the kinds of bees or butterflies or moths that you want? And what are, what's in your, your neighborhood right now? Well, if, if it's a butterfly that primarily exists on the West Coast, you're not going to attract them, folks. So you need to know what's here in Northeast Ohio. And we can try to create the habitats in a way that won't encourage some of the unwanted species. And primarily, we'll do that by the size in which we create our habitats, okay? or where we create them. You, you've got to have diversity in order. It, one, one type of flower is not going to be enough for the bees or the butterflies. One type of watering hole is not going to be enough for everybody so on. And thinking about what's already in your yard. Do you have fruit producing plants? You may not even realize that you do. If they've got berries on them, they're fruit producing. Even if they're itty bitty ber berries. We've got a couple of wild cherries in the backyard. Oh boy, do the birds love those. And I just, we just leave them. They're not bothering us. We didn't plant them. Guess who planted them? The birds. Most of your volunteers come from the birds or the squirrels. Uh, bird feeders, if you don't have natural feed for them, then you can put up bird feeders. Make sure that they ke are kept clean and that you refresh them occasionally because they can carry diseases. Snags and den trees are wonderful. Snags are dead trees that have cavities or uh, places for the critters to nest in and roost in. And den trees are actually live trees that have developed a um, hole in them that can be used as a house by some critter. And brush piles. We're going to talk about those and we're going to talk about some of the cleanup may that you do are, are currently doing right now. Maybe you should stop. <laughs> we're going to get to that too. Now, think about your landscape. If, if you left a field and, and walked away from it, it's going to develop in stages. There's going to be a sequence. So you're going to get the low growing stuff. And then you're going to start getting some of the taller stuff. And then you're going to get the really tall stuff. It's going to develop. Well, in your property, in your backyard, you interrupt that sequence. And you do it either by planting a lawn, and we'll talk about that, and or you just plant low growing stuff because, or you plant lots of tall growing stuff because you want the shade and you want to protect yourself from the neighbors or whatever. But in a untouched plant community, they develop over time. They change and they change in a uh, very orderly fashion. And lawns and gardens are 
are really what we think about as that early succession in a, in a place where you're not touching anything. Trees and shrubs come later. There is less diversity if you don't interfere, but you want to interfere in the right way. So, I don't know that anybody has lawns like this, but they were the best pictures I could get to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Do you have a huge expanse of lawn and not much else? Do you have a huge expanse of lawn, but a lot of other stuff? You're getting better. Do you have a little bit of lawn and lots of other stuff? That's great. This one, that's what my backyard looks like. There ain't no grass there. That's, you can't see it very well, but it's clover and violets. That's what we'd like to have people go to. <laughs> what we want to do is we want to improve the diversity of our, our backyards and our front yards. And there's something that is picking up steam. It started in the UK and it's picking up steam here. It's called No Mow May. You don't get your mower out until June. Because if you don't mow, until the first of June, what happens to your front lawn, especially, or your whatever part of your lawn, that especially if you don't use any herbicides on it, what you're gonna get is something that the bees are gonna absolutely love. And then you can go back and you can mow it. And you can put signs in your front yard that says, this is a no mow may lawn so that you know you're not going to get stuff that grows beyond what most neighborhoods are going to allow They're gonna, you're going to get low growing stuff and the bees are going to be absolutely delighted what's in it that delights the bees just the grass no there's, you're going to get clover you're going to get dandelions we got this real hatred of dandelions but the bees love them oh they're a wonderful source of pollen, you know? And so for, for May, you have dandelions in your lawn. Whoever said they were wrong. Can I also add that what you're also doing is providing a habitat for um, pupating larvae and stuff. Um, so you're providing a habitat for the development of other um, insects and critters that are gonna come out. Right, uh, that, and that's an excellent point because just think about it. When you're mowing the lawn, what are you doing? You're killing them all. You don't, you're not giving them a chance. And they may have already started to overwinter for you in, your, in your lawn. And so come May, they're just really grooving up. Yeah, you just stomped them down. So thank you. So what we want to do is we want to get some edges. These these are called edges. We want to get vertical structure, and we want to get interspersion. We want things to uh, be next to one another and sharing things. So plant under your, your oak tree so that things are wintering over in there. And it's still pretty. I mean, none of these things are ugly. <laughs> it's just the, what we think about when we see dandelions. In fact, my neighbor came over one, one year and I, I have a sort of wooded area that uh, I pay attention to just to get rid of the tree of heaven, because that one I don't like. And he, <laughs> I had a dandelion that was this freaking tall and it had a top root that wasn't gonna quit. And he said, boy, you, you ever gonna dig that one out? And I said, well, maybe. I mean, it ain't bothering anybody. So, the, and what the greater diversity of vegetation gives you is it's gonna give, as Phyllis pointed out, cover and protection for a lot of stuff. It's gonna provide food for a lot of stuff. And it's all gonna be in a relatively small area uh, if it's your backyard, because I don't know about you, but I don't have a palatial area. I have a very small, less than a 
less than a half acre. Okay, the edges you create when two things come together, the tall ones and the short ones, or the lawn and the uh, flower garden. It's different levels of vegetation. They, the shrubs are going, these shrubs are abutting low growing herbaceous stuff. So it's a way to create, and it's also beautiful. Come on, it's gorgeous. And what you really want to do is get a, a gradual transition. You don't want to go from a lawn to a, a oak tree and that's all you've got. That isn't enough. So you want to add some shrubs between the lawn and the big trees. Or have islands. It's another way to do it. And the vertical structure is the different layers. So you've got the low growing, you've got the medium, you've got the tall. And again, it, it provides a lot of the stuff, cover, nesting, roosting, that's kind of the same, and food. I mean, it's providing a whole bunch of stuff for these things. And different species are going to gravitate to different layers. So you ground bees and some of your pupating uh, moths and, and butterflies are going to be in the lower, but your birds are going to be up higher. So you want to give enough variety. And so the different habitats will, uh, is called dis interspersion. So we've got some tall growing stuff over here, some lower growing stuff, some very low growing stuff. And think of it as a patchwork quilt, maybe where you, you are creating uh, patterns and, and you, you're thinking horizontal versus vertical, but you want to think in both the dimensions, really. And if at all possible, use native plants. Because the more native plants you get, the more variety you get in the critters that you're attracting, especially the songbirds and the butterflies and the moths and the bees. Uh, natives are, and especially with bees, the only non-native bee is the honeybee. We brought the honeybees in. The unfortunate thing is when you pick up a, an insecticide thing and it says it's safe for bees, it's safe for honeybees. It'll kill every other bee, or it might, but it is, it is tested only on honeybees. Well, honeybees are not native. Regular bees, some of our native, uh, all of the other bees that we have in this area are native. And so if you give them native plants to, to get the nectar and the pollen from, they're going to increase, and they're going to increase your native plants because it's a symbiotic relationship. Okay. So go native whenever possible. But watch where you buy them because some of the companies who are, raise native plants and sell them as native plants, they are in fact native, but they treat them with insecticides, especially nico nicotonian or, yeah. It's, at any rate, it's, it's a nicotine-based, uh, yeah, but at, at any rate, I can't say the word and I can't get it into my head. Um, at any rate, it stays in the plants for years. So the smaller native plant producers and growers don't use that stuff. So be very careful, especially if you go to a box store and they say that they're natives. Well, they may have this insecticide in their system because they're, they're, they treat them systemically. It comes up from the roots and goes into the plant. It keeps it from being chewed on. Well, sorry, chewing is what some of our insects do in order to survive. And so you got to put up with it. it. It really does enhance your garden. Your garden's going to love it because they're being planted where they should be growing, basically. Okay. 
All right, snags and den trees. Well, nearly three dozen species in Northeast Ohio use snags for roosting and food. Uh, woodpeckers love snags and den trees. They just adore them. And even mammals uh, like bats and grace, all of the squirrels that we have, raccoons and possums, they all use snags and, and den trees, but also amphibians and reptiles. So your toads and your snakes in certain life cycles um, are going to be using these, these trees, whether they're den or snags. And, you know, you have to be careful. And I've got a caution screen up in it coming up. But if, if it's in the back of your property, who cares? It's not as unsightly as you think it is if you think about what it's providing. And they are used for nesting and shelter and feeding because there are going to be insects in there. If it's a, de de you know, decaying tree, there's going to be lots of yummy stuff in there for, for certain critters. You do want to check for the stability of a snag, but nobody's going to have a snag in their front lawn. You're not going to leave it there, you know. Come on. Although Lake Erie College has one. It's got a, I, I don't know if you drive down past. There's this huge tree, and in the bottom is a hollow that's, it's about as big as that, you know. Um, so, I'm not sure if it's a den tree or if it's a snag, but I'm pretty sure it's on the way to being a snag. <laughs> now, if you don't have a way to have snags or den trees, you know, all of your trees are nice and healthy and you want to keep them that way and everything's fine, well, you can always put up nest boxes and you'll choose the nest box size based on what you want to attract. So if you do, and I know some people are averse to this, but if you want to attract some bats, you can get a bat box. And why do you want to attract bats? Because they get rid of lots of skeeters. Yeah. But you're going to want to put them in late winter because you want to catch them when the spring migration starts. Okay. And so you decide, I mean, these are pretty big, this is a pretty big animal. That's a fairly smallish one. There's an owl poking out. Um, owls are fun to, to get in your backyard. I came home, I used to, it was years ago, oh, way back in my past. Um, I was coming home from teaching at Lake Erie College and I got out of the car, out of the garage, and I heard this Okay, so I kind of snuck around the, out of the garage and looked. Huge, beautiful, gorgeous white owl just sitting there. And it took one look at me and said, eh, I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, it, no, it was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Haven't seen him since. <laughs> Brush piles. These are wonderful things. And we're going to talk a little bit about them later on when we talk about cleaning up in the fall. They provide cover. They provide food sometimes. They are a wonderful way to use some of the twigs that are falling down. Now, I have, I, I told you I don't like the tree of heaven. It's called Atlantis. It keeps throwing, literally, I swear it does, throwing twigs into our backyard. I mean, because it, it's on the other side of my fence, I can't do anything to it. it. Belongs to the Y, but it just keeps throwing these twigs into our backyard. Well, instead of getting upset at these, I'm going to turn them into a brush pile. So I'm just going to tell the, the, the Ilanthus, well, that's enough for this year, but it's going to be cover for small an mammals. And you start with bigger stuff at the bottom so that it has stability. And then you, you end up with small limbs. And I love this picture of this little kid. He's putting together a brush pile for his mommy or daddy. He's doing it all by himself. But if you've got it near a water source, you're going to get lots of songbirds on it. You're going to get your, your snakes and your toads and your other amphibians hunkering down in there. I, 
years ago when I put my, used to put my orchids out in the backyard. I had one sitting up because it had a lot of droopy stuff on a pot and I picked up the pot and I went, oh, hello, sir. <laughs> I put it right back down again. It was a, it was a snake. Uh, it was a beautiful green snake. Oh, gorgeous. And I just put it back there and figured when he wanted to get out, he, he, he would be able to. Um, so, but they will. Um, and you, if you build them too big, you're going to get raccoons and possums and other larger critters, maybe even skunks. But if you build them small, you're going to get the smaller stuff. So just keep them small and you won't get the raccoons or the possums or the skunks. So this is a brush pile and these are the kinds of things, I mean, everything. Snakes, salamanders, bunny rabbits, bugs. I think that's a chipmunk. Birds of galore. So, and of course, caterpillars and bugs and beetles. But this is a caution. I've already said it. it if you get, make them too large, you're gonna get raccoons, skunks, possums. Another caution is check your dead trees that they are stable if and you can get an arborist to come in and, and find out for you and if they aren't stable then yeah take them down you don't want somebody walking by them and getting knocked on the head by with them but if they're stable and and a lot of snags will remain stable for years because they've got a strong root structure and that's just going to cement them to the ground for a good long time. So, water. You need to have it out all the time. Who uses them? Everybody. But birds especially, it gets rid of parasites. Uh, amphibians use it to breed and uh, as a shelter. And butterflies uh, love dirty water. They really do. And they get minerals and salts for their diet. Okay, you can, you can put out just a, a very small saucer with virtually nothing in it and you'll see butterflies coming in and having a real, real treat. You want to put the water where you can watch, right? Why put it behind your garage if you can't see the, peop the, the critters that go and enjoy it? because that's one of the reasons you do it, okay? You can get a specialty one. You can get one that has a, a, a water feature in it. You can do all sorts of things, or you can make your own. And you can either put it on the ground, but watch out if you've got cats in the neighborhood, because they will just wait. I know, we have them. And they do wait, and they do take it bird or two. But, and, and if you can, figure out how to heat it in winter or go out there and knock the ice so that the water is available. But there are, there are, you can buy ones that have little bitty heaters in them that are actually run by the sun so that they stay. And if you do have a water feature, you don't have to worry about the heater because the water feature will keep it going. And you'll also not have um, have to clean them quite because it's being aerated. Okay. I love this picture. I hope you can see it. There's a big bucket and that's for the bigger critters. Okay. But there's a inlay and then there's this wash, washboard to use as a way to get in and out. And I mean it's the birds love it because they, they can only take two to three inches. They can't, they don't, they'll drown because they can't get. Um, you really need something that's going to have no slippery um, slopes or anything. And you can put, it, put one in the ground that isn't necessarily for the birds, but it's for the amphibians and the mammals. Uh, and graded levels are great. I mean, I, I used to have a fairly deep one and I just put rocks in there and the birds could get on the rocks and they'd get a drink of water and they, or they'd splash around. And then it was also big enough for other critters to get in. But you, if you do have one, like if this were on the ground, you need a ramp so that they can get to it. 
yard work is for the birds. It really is. But, but it's also for everybody else. If you've got leaves, I know people have a real high need to have everything clean and neat. Yeah. I'm not one of those people. So I don't care, except I don't let them lie where I want it, something to live, okay? So I'm not gonna let them lie on my lawn because it's gonna create problems. You can let them lie, but as long as there's chance for sun to get through them. You can rake them into flower beds. They make a wonderful mulch over winter. And you can mulch them into the lawn, which gives nutrients to the lawn. And your fallen branches become a, a, a brush pile. And this little critter is going to be very happy to have a brush pile instead of it put in a bag and left on your lawn to be taken away. And so are the, the butterflies. One of the things that leaves do is it provides the, an environment where a lot of the uh, pollinators can lay their eggs and raise their caterpillars. There are some that the first things they eat when they hatch or when they become a caterpillar are dead oak leaves. That's their first diet. And the, the other thing is you'll find birds are going after those leaves too because they're going to be eating some of those critters. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a jungle out there. You've got to watch out. Okay, if you've got annuals and perennials, don't cut them back because the seed heads feed the birds over the, over the winter. If you've never seen a goldfinch sitting on a cosmos, swaying in the breeze, it's, it's just an in incredibly stellar sight. So, you know, leave those. Some of them uh, in, in the spring, you don't necessarily want to pull them out or cut them back completely. If, if they're perennials, if you cut them down to about anywhere from 12 to 8 inches, it provides a habitat for bees. They will use the stems to lay their eggs. And what will happen is, as a perennial, everything will grow up around it and it won't make any difference. And then when they're done using it, you probably can just go out there and pull them out. And let's face it, some of us are getting so old that they don't want to go out there and do this. <laughs> um, but you, if you leave it, then you're, you're going to get a much more variety of, of critters in your backyard or front yard. The, these are the cautions. If you, if you leave leaves on the lawn and they're too thick, you're going to kill your lawn, you're going to get snow mold, and you're going to get disease. So that's not what I'm recommending. And if you, if you leave them, well, you would never leave them on your driveway. or your, Come on because you're going to slip and fall. So you're not going to do that. The other thing is, if you happen to have a foresty area near you, and you say, well, I'll just put all the leaves over there, and you create a huge mass of them, that's going to encourage ticks. So, you know, don't, don't make a thick layer of them. And it's, it's because the forest is where they're coming from. They're not coming from your lawn necessarily. They're coming from the forest, and it's a nice place to roost. So be careful about that. But I don't know if many of you abut a forest. <laughs> you know, a friend of mine abuts a forest, but there's a drop, and so she just blows all of her leaves down there, and it works for her. Okay, protection. All right, rabbits and voles. There's your vole. It looks like a small mouse. Those are your rabbits. They're cute as the dickens. But they will, vol, voles especially, will eat the center of a perennial. And if you leave your mulch up against a tree, bring it back a good three to four inches. They'll, they'll hunker down in that nice warm spot, and they'll just eat all the way around your tree. 
So will the bunnies. And they'll kill your tree because that's called girdling. The, the tree's nutrition goes up between the bark and the inner part of the tree. And so if you girdle a tree, in other words, take a little bit around all the way around, and you don't leave any, there's no way for the nutrients to get up, the tree will die. So uh, you pull it away from the trunks. You can use chicken wire, you can use hardware screening or paper tree wrap, anything that will protect them from getting the animals getting to you, to that. So if you've got perennials that you fear the, the critter's gonna eat the center for, out of, then put some something over it, make sure they can't get under it, and it will protect it over, over winter. Remember, these are small animals. So they can probably get through one layer of chicken wire, but they can't get through two as long as they're not perfectly aligned, <laughs> which you wouldn't do anyway. They need to be at least two feet tall because you've seen rabbits. They get up on their hind legs and they can, they can do all sorts of damage, you know, some of the big ones. They can reach at least 18 inches. And voles will strip the bark and eat, eat the crowns of perennials, so you have to be careful about them. And you want to take it up in March because you need the plants to be able to start growing and breathe. For, for deer, I mean, we love them, right? They're so cute. Here's Mama. She's going to leave her little buddy in your backyard and know that you're not going to hurt it because you love this cute little thing. And she'll come back at the end of the day and she'll have something for him to eat. But in the winter, they're looking for food just like everybody else. You can use plastic tubes to cover your trees. And actually, the interesting thing about the tree shelters is because it keeps no warmth in there, if it's a young sapling, it's good environment and it grows faster. So that's pretty good. The problem is if it's open, you're gonna get bugs down there. Well, who's gonna go after those bugs? Your birds, okay? So your birds fly down, uh-oh, can't get out. So you just put a covering on that so that the birds don't go in. Your fencing needs to be at least six to eight feet tall because they can jump that high. And they go straight up and in. If you do put it up, you put it up in an angle so that if they try to jump up, they hit it. <laughs> and tree wraps, you've got to do at least three feet. Look at, I mean, these are just, ah, yum, yum, yum. And you can also provide sacrificial plants. Hostas are candy to deer. They adore it. So if you know that that's their track and you don't want them veering off to get to your other good stuff, sacrifice your hostas. You know? Yes? Isn't there a problem with deer because they're too predators for them? Ohio that, right, and in fact, we re-imported the deer several decades ago. They were not here. They weren't, and they were brought in. Why? Oh, because whoever was living out in Kirtland decided that it would be a good idea to have deer. <laughs> I don't know. At any rate, um, there was something else I wanted to say about deer. Yes. If you provide the sacrificial plants, will that encourage them to come to your yard? No, no, no. You'll only do it when you know that that's their track. You don't, in, you don't do it to encourage them to come. It's, it's if you know that every time they cut through your yard, they just, and they do, they, they come up with tracks that okay. they, and they follow it. I mean, they very rarely will diverge from their usual pattern. And so what, if you find that they are, in fact, reaching up to get that, that yummy fruit tree or whatever, but you know that they just go right down that pathway. They don't go that way, they, don't go, they go right down that way. Then put, the, put them there. It's just so that they have something 
that they can get as they're traveling to the, <laughs> the next yard, the next garden, because that's what they do. Uh, but they, they're very, cre very much creatures of habit. Yes? Um, for tree wraps, um, if you want a lightweight one that you can see through, or just that, that lightweight netting, yeah. wrap it around. Yeah. That's enough to keep them yeah. It, it really just has to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, a, another thing you can do if you have, the, if you have a wide expanse of stuff um, and you don't typically go, you know, you just want to protect the area, you can put up fish line, fish line um, at, you know, at, at about four foot and maybe at six foot and they'll, they won't see it. And they'll bounce into it and they'll startle them and they'll go off someplace else. Okay? What I did, I just remembered what I was going to say. <laughs> Yay. Unfortunately, in winter, most of the products that you can buy that are deer repellent don't work under 20 degrees. So uh, you can spray it every day if you want. It's not going to do any good whatsoever. So, yes? I was, I was going to say, in the spring and summer, we've had uh, success with something called liquid fence. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason is, is because it'll keep anybody away. I think they make it from more cast-offs or something because it, it's really stinky and smelly. So it even keeps our neighbors away. <laughs> <laughs> Which is but sometimes yeah, a good idea. Right. But it, yeah, it doesn't do it in the but, but deer will actually, they can actually be trained and they observe each other. So if they see another deer, especially the young ones, if they see another deer go into an area and they're stopped by like um, fishing line or something like that, they actually learn from that deer, oh, that's not a place to go. Mm -hmm. So They're intelligent. Yeah, yeah. Fishing wire or even, even uh, high enough brush piles yeah. will discourage them from getting into certain areas. Yeah. And, but of course, the, the trade-off is then you're going to encourage the bigger animals right. to your brush pile. But getting a possum in your yard isn't necessarily a bad thing. No, no. Because they'll eat the grubs. You know? no. so. We, uh, They, uh, we got one in our house once. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing. That's, that's not a good thing, no, because they, 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 they have no defenses. And have you heard of any merit using um, fragrant soaps like Tiger Spring? You know, they, the thing about anything that has a scent to dis deter deer, they get used to it. Yeah. And so, that's why you, you, you uh, tend to trade one, you know, one stinky thing for another stinky thing for another stinky thing and then start all over again because they get, so it, even if it worked, it's only going to work for the first time because then you got to find a different kind of soap. But I, I don't, we, we don't have any research on that. So um, it's just all stinky things will deter them for a while, but won't deter them forever. Okay, summary. We want to provide winter habitats because we want to sustain nature. I mean, we, we've been doing enough damage to our natural resources for much too long. It's about time for us to pay back, I think. And so this helps. Uh, and even if you just make a couple of small changes, it's going to make a big, big difference. And it's also going to make you happier because you're going to get to watch all these critters. And we want to support the songbirds and the butterflies and the other po pollinators, even our mammals and uh, amphibians. And they're going to support us in the end. Yes? Uh, I, have a, I have a question about the songbirds. We feed the birds in the wintertime. But here recently, we have had a problem with hawks. Oh, yeah. Out, you know. Oh, yeah. So is that just the circle of life? Or circle of life. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we, we have hawks in our backyard, and we got some beautiful ones. And they will just, they'll actually <laughs> sit on our picnic table. With, they just right. wait. They wait. Yes. Sure they will. Yeah. And, but the birds are smart enough to keep sleeping and, you know, and, and not not be available but the one the i don't know why but the hawks are going after my doves they don't go for the little ones 
they want a big dinner, <laughs> so they go after the doves. They can go squirrels too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they will. That wouldn't bother me a bit. <laughs> yes. I wonder. I have birdhouses out. We moved recently, and for two winters, I haven't gotten any little birds that go in. And we took the perches off because that you shouldn't have a perch for the squirrels, I guess. I don't know that you. Is there nothing that you can do to attract them? Uh, because we get finches at our feet. They're yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of the houses are going to be for wrens, and wrens are funny little birds because the daddy wren scopes out the neighborhood. Okay, that one, I, I like that one. Okay, he builds the nest. He builds that one comfortable. The others, not so much. And she comes along. And he says, here, dear, here are four for you to choose from. And it will go for that one, because that's what Daddy wanted her to do in the first place. And he just makes it comfy for her. Um, we have had them up every once in a while. One year we'll, we'll get, and last year they did, they visited one of them. But, but I've, we've had years when they heard the one year that really troubled my husband was when and this was when we used to leave our garage door open we don't anymore because there was a hanging basket that I had and the dang bird nested. nested in it and his exhaust pipe is right there and he was scared to death he was going to kill these poor wren and we couldn't move it so yeah mm. So old hanging baskets make great. Oh, oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I I left two. I I left two. I'm sure my neighbors are, are thinking I'm just too lazy to move them, but uh, because one of them is dead and the other one's dying. But I've been seeing all sorts of birds visit it to get the seeds from it, and so they just they're they're going to stay up there. I don't, neighbors can. Yeah, you know, the, the neighbor across the street has just. <laughs> Halloween display. <laughs> that covers his front lawn and his side lawn. And so if he doesn't like my hanging baskets looking dead. <laughs> yeah. um, at Menor Lagoons, they have those bird houses way up in the yeah. air. Yeah. I think they're Swifts or something. Uh, Swift Tower. Per, yeah, Purple Martins or Swift. Swift Tower. Oh, yeah. now there's a sign at it. Oh. Same with this. Okay. It actually looked, the ones that look like chimneys, they sell wooden chimneys. Yeah. One last anecdote. I was out in our backyard and the neighbor called me over and said, Susan, have you seen a snake? And I said, No. I said, Well, come on, I got to show you. So, in a wood pile that he, it was actually wood that he used to build his fence. A snake had taken up residence. Well, his daughter and his other daughter and his wife, all that is his. Get rid of that. I won't go outside. I won't go outside ever again if you don't get rid of it. Well, he goes to get rid of it, and guess what? It was smart enough. Came over to our yard. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, now, if you, if you find it, let me know, and I'll come and get it. It moved slowly, ever so slowly, through our backyard and went to somebody else's backyard. But yeah, he was there for, in our backyard for several weeks. I didn't rat on him. He was, he was too pretty. OK, uh, there's a bunch of references. You don't really need to see them. I uh, except to know that this really was research-based information. <laughs> OK, that's where we live. Uh, we've moved, if you're not familiar, to Maine uh, in the, the Lake County building. So we're on the fourth floor. Um, you can still drop off samples. People will look at them. They'll call you. Good, good stuff. That's our email. That's our OSU. It's, sorry, lakeosu.edu. It's on that uh, little thing that had all the information on it about what's coming up. So all of this is on that. Maybe not the address, but at any rate. Helpline, it's done now. 
but you can still call and leave a message and somebody will get back to you. You can go to Ohio Line for fact sheets. And this is something I like to point out because it's really, really wonderful for getting research-based information. If you're going to Google or whatever search engine you use, start every search, well, maybe not if it isn't a horticultural thing, but if, if you're starting a search for native plants in your area, whatever, start with site, colon, edu, and then put whatever your search is. And what will come up is information from all colleges and universities, all research-based, all really good stuff. But <laughs> make sure that you pay attention to where it's from. If it's an EDU in California, it probably is not going to be very helpful. If it's from Florida, it may not be very helpful. Cornell, Penn State, some of the others that are in our environment would be the most useful. Okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Just one. That, so basically, that, as far as the hawks are concerned, just should I take the bird feeder down for a while to try to deter the hawks, or just they won't? All you'll do is you'll be hurting the birds. They the hawks don't eat the, the bird feed, and so if you take if you take that down then the birds will go elsewhere to, and they may not come back. So if the hawk gets a couple of birds, that's just that's, that's what happens. Okay. And unfortunately, you have to clean up the feathers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> What's your feeling on pigeons? Uh, my neighbor uh, feeds the pigeons every morning, and they come over for a breakfast, and then they end up in my yard. My lawn is covered with pigeons. Mm. You have to have a conversation with your neighbor, basically. Um, you know, it's... Feed her hawk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, are they pigeons or are they doves? Yeah. I mean, I've got doves, and they're fine. They, they cool a lot, and they're pretty. And they get eaten by the hawks. But I, really, um, if she wants to feed them and it's impacting you, then you need to have a conversation with her. Um, I mean, it's like some neighbors complain because their uh, neighbors feed the deer. Uh, you know, the deer need food too, but you know, if it's impacting you, then that's, you've got to have a conversation with your neighbor. That's the best thing I can say. Not that I'm aware of, no more than any other bird. They're just very, very common. And, uh, but. Um, One thing you might do is if you, if you have a good relationship with your neighbor is maybe emphasize that during the uh, spring and summer months, feeding birds, providing, you providing food for birds um, isn't necessarily a good thing. The best thing is to plant native plants and let, your, let nature provide the food. Now, winter, it's a little bit different yeah. because they don't have access to the food. So at our, in our yard, we don't feed our birds until it's frozen and it's really cold. But we do provide them with native plants, and we get a lot of birds. So, but what that LSAT does is it um, attracts beneficial birds and birds that you might want. So those, those pigeons would probably go elsewhere. So I don't know if you have a good enough relationship with your neighbor that you can educate him or her? No. It, it really does require the conversation yeah, it, with, yeah. with the neighbor one way or the other. So, All right. Uh, we won't see you again in 2022, but we hope to see you in 2023 mm -hmm. in March, where we are hoping to have espaliered fruit trees. Oh.